Hello, everyone. Welcome to UIHS's Facebook Live. My name is Liz Lara O'Rourke, and I am Hoopa, Yurok, and Cholula. I'm also the Tribal Public Health Director and Public Information Officer at UIHS. Tonight, we are talking about what, we, what can happen when you get COVID, the importance of vaccination and new treatment that's available. Thank you, Joe and Jai, for your courage to share your experience having had COVID. And thank you, Dr. Martinez, for taking the time to share some new information about COVID treatment. But before we get started, Joe, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, I'm a retired uh, university professor from Humboldt State, but I'm an enrolled member of a uh, Talawadini nation. Um, my mother was a Whipple, and uh, my family includes the Hostlers and the Bobs and the Smileys up there. And uh, I'm a 71 year old husband, father of two, grandfather of 10 to keep me busy. And I'm on tribal council at Talawadani Nation for the, coming up on 15 years in May. And uh, let's see what else. Um, maybe that's enough for right now. Thank you for inviting. Me. Thank you for inviting me. Jai, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi. Uh, well, my name is Jai Mokibi. Um, I'm 46 years old. I lived around here all my life. I got four kids, uh, I'm a grandpa, um, Yurok, Kadook, Pit River, and Weot. And uh, yeah, like Joe said, thank you for asking me to come do this. Dr. Martinez, tell us about you. Haku, I am Antoinette Martinez, one of the doctors at United Indian Health Services. I'm Chumash, so I'm a visitor in Weot, Yurok, and all the tribes that are indigenous to this area. I consider them very important people in my life. Uh, many elders who took me under their wing and you know, encouraged me to go on to be a doctor. So um, I really uh, appreciate everything that they did and hopefully I can give back. It's great to ha have all three of you here. I've um, known all of you literally for 30 years, 25, 30 years. So it's great to have everyone here tonight. But before Joe and Jai share their story, I wanna ask our viewers to please type in your questions and comments in the area in the chat box. Um, when you make a, ask a question, make a comment, we'll enter you into a drawing and we'll be do doing a drawing for great prizes. And then we'll contact you if you're a winner. So be sure to send in your comments. So Joe, I first learned about your story back in May. We were on travel and you told me about what happened when you were diagnosed with COVID. And I think it was back in December. Was it December or January? Yes, December 11th. And this was before vaccines were available, right? Yeah, I think I after I got sick and was in the hospital in uh, rehabilitation hospital in Reading, uh, I think I got the first uh, shot over there. It was about mm -hmm. two or three weeks before I was discharged. The vaccine was now available and they, somebody came in from a, a pharmacy store. So tell us, tell us about that journey. Wow, yeah, uh, I think I, uh, well, it's very odd because you know you're just involved you in your normal life right and like we had a we had a uh, board meeting that week at Potawat, a board of directors meeting and um four days later i was in the hospital four nights later i was in the hospital after participating in a board meeting um and i, I had been coughing but uh, i think i might have minimized like the severity of what the cough meant you can't you can't minimize what this cough can do, mm -hmm. and I think I probably waited. I don't know, you know, uh, four to seven days too long. I should have got tested immediately, and by the time I was admitted on December 11th, uh, my my lungs, my body was on fire with COVID. Wow, it just happened like that before you knew it. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately. 
I grew up with having bronchitis quite a few times, you know, in Indian country, like sometimes our homes aren't in insulated the best. <laughs> so Humboldt County weather, mold everywhere. But anyway, I, I, uh, I've had bronchitis quite a few times during my adulthood. You always think about, yeah, it's just that time of the year, a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I should not have been thinking that way because this this disease, this particular disease is it's not innocent at all. It's just, it's opportunistic. It wants to go after you. And so um, when the first night I went in, the, the ER doctor, I can't remember her name, she said, it's a good thing you came in, Joe. But, you know, she looked at my x-ray with me. She, she had them take, and she said, your lungs are 70% full of fluid. Oh. Not a good start. <laughs> no. So I mean, Dr. Mar yeah, Dr. Martinez, are these coughing, is that a common symptom of somebody who has COVID? Yes, it is one of the common symptoms, including uh, losing the sense of smell, uh, it can also be the high fever, uh, runny nose, which, you know, many of us get runny noses, mm -hmm. but it can present that way. Diarrhea, um, vomiting, are some of the symptoms that people can have, including flu-like symptoms. So they might even think they just had the flu. Mm -hmm. And the I have heard of somebody who thought that it was their allergies and they finally got tested and they actually had COVID. And because it wasn't that bad for them, they've been, they have been immunized. So that's also something that people might think it's their allergies. Right. The last straw for me was my temperature got 102.5. I was kind of burning up and uh, I had one night of horrible night sweats and you wake up and you're just soaking wet and something's totally gone wrong. And you, you know, there's, there's no laughing matter, not that anything connected to illness is a laughing matter, but you know, it's game on at that point. Now, what are some of the um, symptoms that we should be aware of in terms of when do we need to go to the emergency department? Because that is something that happens when we, the doctors will say, you need to go in to be seen in the emergency department right now. What are some of those symptoms? Well, it, it really depends uh, because the bottom line is, is that you, you never know. But first of all, now we're doing rapid testing. So, We've got that on our side now, not compared to when um, you were sick, Joe. And those who are positive, we get them a pulse oximeter so that we can have another tool at their hands to measure the oxygenation. And I found that with a few people, including some of my relatives that uh, they were uh, positive for COVID and they weren't quite making sense with their words. Maybe they were hard to understand and, and they felt anxious. And, um, but it was because the oxygen level was getting too low. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't anxiety because of anxiety. It was anxiety because the lungs weren't working and the body is fighting to breathe. And um, so I know that was one concern I had when I talk to you, Joe, about your symptoms, because it's so hard to know when you can't measure, you can't listen to the lungs, but I could tell that you were getting that foggy headed thinking. Mm -hmm. And well, I was you told me that, I, I missed that part, I forgot that. <laughs> the fuzzy part of it, right? And something too that you had mentioned earlier, Dr. Martinez, is that some people, they want to toughen it out. Like I'm tough enough to, to, to make it through this. And one of the things that you had said earlier is, I mean, you really can't toughen it out. It's, there's a time when we need to go to, when your provider feels like you need to go to the hospital, you really need to listen to your provider. Right. Yeah, we, we really, it, it's a fine line between being tough and, um, going to the hospital, you know, we're survivors. Our people have survived many things. So um, a lot of times we don't even seem like we're very sick, but then turns out we are. Yeah. Um, 
And I know uh, one time I had to talk to patient's family about the patient who I wasn't my patient, but the family was concerned about this patient. Um, and so third hand, I had to say, I think you need to go to the emergency room. <laughs> and the patient went yeah. and got treatment. So yeah, um, it, it's tricky, but uh, uh, especially if you're positive, you want to be really sure that um, you're taken care of right. and that you can fight this right. disease. Yeah. And some families might be worried about paying for a doctor bill. And I just want to remind our watchers that we do have um, purchase referred care, which we all call PRC. And if you're eligible for PRC, we can help you with those hospital bills. So um, if for any reason you end up in the hospital, give us a call at the clinic, ask for PRC, and we can screen you to see if you're eligible for that, um, for that assistance. So don't let that stop you from being seen. Jai, so can you tell us about your experience, um, which was a little bit different from, from Joe's? Um, well, my experience is um, I was getting ready to head down to take my barber test, and I just got done running a run. And um, I, when we got back, like my body was kind of sore already. But before that, like I was having kind of like heart problems, like uh, my heart was skipping and it was kind of bothering me. And uh, we went down there and got back. I think we got back like on Thursday and then I just wasn't feeling very good. And me and my wife weren't feeling good. And then um, we just knew something was wrong because I was my, on my bike. I'm not like in tune with my body, but I can tell like my body is, is kind of being weird. Um, but I didn't know if it was from running, why my body was all sore and stuff and achy. But uh, Brandy went in and got a test and she took him back positive. And then that was on a Saturday. And then on a sun Sunday, we're just like, I was pretty sick. And then on Monday, I was just, it really like hit me. And like Joe was saying, like I had the, like the chills, <clears throat> but I just had like a fever, I was like burning up. And then couldn't eat anything, and my body was all sore. And we just uh, kind of isolated ourselves in our room. And then uh, probably like the fifth or sixth day, it's like I I didn't even want to move or do anything. Just like uh, just lay there, and it's a, like it's the worst uh, like sickness I ever felt. And then uh, it wasn't until like probably like the tenth day that I was probably wanting to go out you know first time I think I went outside actually and then uh, I know I needed that like that like fresh air and stuff but uh yeah I don't know that was kind of my experience I guess so I just want our watchers to know Joe and Jai are very healthy individuals and Jai right before you um tested positive for COVID you were training for a half marathon you were running, and I see you on Facebook. You share your route. You're running how many miles? I was doing like eight, nine, 10, 11, sometimes 12. Yeah. yeah. And this just knocked you down. Yeah, I couldn't even like. So, yeah, uh, I couldn't even run. Like, after I got sick, like, I didn't want to like lose my progression of running. So, I literally tried to go running like maybe about three weeks after I got sick and I could, I could only do like maybe a mile and I couldn't go no further, but I pushed myself, but yeah, I couldn't even do that. Wow. I guess it's just amazing. Um, someone that's so strong, right. And healthy that COVID can have such an impact and you too, Joe, you were, you were a runner as a young man. Both of you, um, have strong lungs, and this just took over, I guess. It does. Um, and I was walking still like, a, I've had a couple um, back surgeries in the last decade and uh, for uh, neuropathy mm -hmm. for, when I worked in the sawmill, I got an injury when I was 18, 19 and 20. I didn't know it until I showed up and then I was 60 or something. But anyway, 
Yeah, I was still walking three or four miles a day on a treadmill, you know, to keep my wind up a little bit, you know, even going slow is darn good for your heart and lungs, you know, you don't have to be like some kind of champion runner to really do yourself a lot of good help by uh, staying active and getting out. And, and so I am so glad that I was walking those three or four miles a day on that treadmill for like six to eight months before I got sick. I think it actually probably might have saved my life along with the other good actions people did, like my MD mm -hmm. that, that I had when I was in there. Yeah, you had a lot of life-saving things occur so that you could spend some more time with us on this earth, that's for sure, and we're so <laughs> thankful. I want to um, acknowledge Dennis and Meadow and Denise, who have left messages and questions on our comment section. Dennis had a question. Um, can someone catch COVID-19 twice or multiple times? Uh, yes. That. <laughs> yes, you can. And um, that is the nature of COVID. Um, doesn't mean you will. So people feel that if they didn't get sick and they were exposed a second time, that you know, they'll be protected forever. And that's not true. Um, COVID is surviving uh, because it is mutating to a more infectious version, more contagious. So it mutates inside of people who are sick with it. And so um, you can get sick once and then twice. And we don't know, maybe even three times. Um, and each time you get sick, it, it can be worse. It can be more disabling. Um, because the damage, you know, is additive if there's long-term damage. So I encourage everyone to get their vaccine yes. to prevent yeah. it, even if they've had COVID. So that's what Joe did when he was still in the hospital. They gave you your vaccination, <laughs> which is great. Um, Katrina is with us. And symptoms that she shared were backache and headaches. And that is also symptoms. Um, I knew somebody who had, he said he such, had such a horrible headache, he couldn't get out of bed for like four days. He just couldn't, nothing would give him relief. He just mm -hmm. had this awful, awful headache. Um, we also want to welcome Rob. And he has some encouraging words. Great seeing you all on this live tonight. You sound great tonight, Joe. I know it's <laughs> been a long journey for you. So one of the things we wanted to ask each of you is it's a long journey for you both, but also it was a long journey for your family, right? They went through this as well. Joe, tell us about this journey for your family while you were in the hospital. Yeah, not being able to see my family for 66 days was, um, I'm not sure how I handled it. That was just a long haul. And, um, they, they, uh, they tried to call up, but I was so weak at a point I couldn't hold the phone up. I would try to hold it up in my ear and I'd drop it because I was just absolutely wiped out. Mm -hmm. And I was, they, they struggled too. Like, uh, my, one of my grandsons, uh, basically cried himself to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, I think my grand, some of my granddaughters kind of dealt with it by doing art projects for me. They sent me a poster. It was really cute you know, with uh, lots of family pictures and drawings and stuff. And it's really hard on, on a, it just, it's, it's so, it's so exacting on the family. It's just so draining. Um, uh, like the, they couldn't get in to see me. One of my friends at the hospital in Eureka, St. Joe took a picture of me. And I was telling uh, you, got, you folks last week, the picture was so ghastly I, that when I look at it or anybody, my family looks at it, we just burst in, we start sobbing immediately. It's that graphic, it's that horrible. Yeah. And you could never, ever, all you could do is like, think of, think of a, a picture of what you look like just before you go into an agonizing death. And there it is, you know, the, being that weak. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just thinking, it's hard for me to look at that one picture. And I've come very close to deleting it, but I don't think I should, you know. It's, and it's, my poor wife, it just, uh, it's really hard on her, super hard on her. And we've been married uh, 
47 years tomorrow, you know, we're hoping to go out to enjoy dinner together. And, you know, it's just, it's just like, it's hard to put into words. It's, it's um, it can be so much pain and fear. I, I, I suppose it's fear, right? But you know, those, when you're sick, like uh, I, me I remember the dreams, I've been writing down the dreams. I had, had about 10, I remember, but you're, you're sort of oblivious to everything. You know, they're, but they're stressing over every number, every, the oxygen level each day, all of that. And this, I think that's good that people like pay attention to the, all the vitals of our oxygen levels of each day and all that and, and be proactive and try to interact. Don't feel ashamed or like you're putting anybody out if you try to call the doctor or the RN. Day. Uh, sometimes it's impossible for them to talk, but the nurses should never ever be you know cranky or or snotty or anything you know that and some of them are fabulous and they just put the phone up to your ear and, or they talk to your spouse and encourage them and and say what time the doctor's coming and all that so just don't be afraid to ask the nurses because most of them have really good hearts and they, they want to they, they don't want you to have to suffer and be in a vacuum if you're the if you're the family member who's outside looking in if you're a family member who your loved one who's in there yeah, it's, um, I imagine it was very, very scary for your family. Um, Jai, you stayed home, you were able to stay home and you had to isolate. How um, did that impact your family? And you were with your wife, you both isolated together. Um, well, any, like, you know, anyone that has kids, uh, you know, our biggest, you know, fear is getting them sick or I hate it when my kids are sick, even when they're little. But now that they're all grown, you know, I still feel that way. And <clears throat> my biggest concern was uh, my grandson. I didn't want to get him sick. And everyone in my house was already uh, vaccinated, you know, except me. And we'd have conversations about it. And I'd be like, yeah, you know, I was like close to getting it. And I always had that, uh, you know, that weariness of not to get it. And then, uh, when I got sick, it was, you know, we all have like a working system in our household and everyone has like a little thing to do to keep the family running. And then, you know, when I was down, everyone had to kind of step up certain ways to, you know, for dinner and rides and practices and, you know, morning routine and stuff. And, you know, when mom and dad are down, you know, you know, it kind of disrupted the balance a little bit. And, uh, you know, my biggest, like I said, my big concern was more well, my kids and then my grandson, obviously, and my granddaughter uh, didn't want to get them sick. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know like the protocol either, you know, because they're so little, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we had to isolate ourselves for that time frame to, uh, you know, where you get past that point to where you're not contagious, I guess. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then uh, once that passed and I was able to see everyone and just kind of you know felt better i guess now at one point you had shared um with us earlier you were going to go to the mountains yeah yeah tell us about that i mean that really um that really struck me jai when you talked about that can you share that story yeah so i forget what day it was but i just like a point to where i told my wife brandy he's like you know, take me to the mountains. I'm like, I'm ready to go. I don't want to die here. You know, just like that's why I don't want to go to the hospital either. Because I don't know. It, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing to happen to to a person um, to feel so close to death. I mean, I think both of you felt really close, really close. <laughs> Doctor Martinez. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I was going to say the day I got tested, uh, I walked upstairs. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I'm getting ready to go to the clinic to get tested. I said, I'm not going to die here at the house. Yeah, it's it's serious. I guess it's much more serious than what you thought it would be, Jai. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, it's just a point where, you know, you don't think about that stuff and right. you think of all the stories you hear all the stories of people getting sick and some like uh you know they just test positive and they keep going and then you hear uh, uh, elders or uh 
you know, other adults getting sick and then having a terrible time, you know, like Joe, you know, that, you know, almost didn't make it. And uh, so everyone takes it differently. So I kind of had that, like, you know, I guess the back of my mind, like if I did get it, then I could pull through. But then when it hit me, it was like nothing I could do about it to make myself feel better. Uh, you know, I just had to uh, not wait it out, but just I was in the mercy of it, I guess, you know, to mm-hmm. whatever it was going to, whatever damage is going to do to me, that's what it done. And if I didn't make it, you know, then I didn't make it. But luckily, you know, that's the way I felt, you know, I, I don't, yeah. you know, I, I wasn't, mine wasn't extreme as uh, Joe's, but that's the way I felt at the time. You know? Yeah. Joe, did you have something to share? Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to share that, uh, that a, an MD, a traveling MD from Houston, he's from uh, Madagascar in South Africa. Uh, he, he saved my life and I was in there because um, he, he saw that my lungs were really were full this time. You know, this was like, after being there for three weeks. And he, he did, he knew how to do what's called a bronchoscopy. And he took him about two hours. And he drew all that fluid out of my lungs that were preventing me from being able to draw a breath. I was still wiped out. As bad as I wanted, I could do nothing to move my diaphragm to, you know, my, to get my lungs to be able to bring in air, oxygen. And so he did that. And then within 20 minutes, I was breathing like, I think maybe 100% oxygen. And um, so I went from completely upside down, maybe not make it to, he saved my life. And he's, my wife asked him, what about that? And he said, well, it's a procedure that's not done often enough. And we lose a lot of people because of it. So I was thinking about, you know, in Indian country, we kind of think that, well, you know, like there is a time that we all will leave this place physically, but, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, not all the MDs know how to do it. Sometimes the other PhDs have training who are not medical doctors. Like there are other people in the pulmonology realm who know how to do bronchoscopies, but they don't save everybody's life. And I think there's there's a timing issue or a question. But I, I was really extremely fortunate. But I had hundreds of people praying and hoping, asking the Creator and you know for help for me. And so I think that that all played a hand in me surviving. Yeah, I I do too. I totally believe in prayer. So I want to remind our viewers to comment, like, and share, um, and we can enter you into a drawing. I do want to say hello to Teresa. She says, hi, everyone. Thank you for doing another COVID-19 educational Facebook series. So thank you all. Before we move on, Dr. Martinez, can you tell us, and Jai kind of touched on this too, because he's a young man, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking that if he gets it, um, it's going to be like the flu, but it's not. There are some long-term effects that happen even to young people. So can you talk about that a little? Yes, yes, I can. And, um, and so, yes, especially with the new variant, um, more we ha- we are seeing young adults getting this COVID infection and getting hospitalized. Um, we also are seeing children in the ICUs, in uh, pediatric ICUs, and in intubated um, due to this more aggressive infectious COVID. Um, so in that. We, we want to get rid of it. And the way we're gonna get rid of it is by vaccinating everybody. So that's one. But the other part is, is that getting sick, you never know, you know, when you get to this point, it's like the luck of the draw in a lot of ways, you know, go to the hospital, stay home, go to the hospital, don't know. And so even when I talked to Joe on the phone that night, I couldn't say, Joe, you have to go to the hospital because there's this fine line about choice. And, but he did, he ended up going and he's alive because of it. And Jai, you chose to stay at home and you were okay, you fought it. You came out of it, even though you were really sick. So it's also about this, combination of personal choice. We do know that 
when someone's really sick, the best care you will get is in the intensive care unit. Those are what I call the best nurses there because they are micromanaging every little number, every IV, every, everything is sequenced and, and they're quite amazing. So um, the scary part is even now, if someone's sick, they go into the hospital and may not have family with them. Mm -hmm. that's and that's tough. so hard. Um, finding it even with people who are sick with other things. Um, you know, they don't want to stay in the hospital because they can't have family with them. Yeah. And I just hope that community members keep in mind that when you go to the hospital, if it's at that point, this is where you get the best that medical care can offer. And when we lose one person, whether it's a child, an elder, a traditionalist, a language keeper, one person, it's not just that one person, we're losing our gold, mm -hmm. the gold that we have for our culture and sustaining our families and our tribes. And so, you know, just keep, keep telling people, you know, we want you all to stay healthy. Yeah. Now there is some good news coming down the pipeline. And that is that uh, there's a treatment now called monoclonal antibody. Uh, it is available for people who are in a certain category of risk and who are positive for COVID. So um, we talk to people about this when they come through our COVID tent and I want everybody to be aware of it. Um, so it is, um, it can help catch early COVID. So there are criteria that they cannot treat people with. So if they're needing oxygen, um, there are different categories that um, I'd have to look at my list to refer to. But, um, but the bottom line is you can't be super sick. If you're super sick, you need to be in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But if you have mild or moderate disease and you're positive for COVID, and I say even just being American Indian, Alaska Native, we are in a high risk population. And so that infusion is about two hours of time. You get referred there from your doctor they do it in two hours at Providence St. Joe's for local folk here. And um, it can help prevent some of the worst symptoms or signs of the infection. Okay, it's good to know. Yeah. So Dr. Martinez, can I ask you a question about oxygen? Yes. I know they're extremely concerned about mine when I was in there. Those, you know, I was on a ventilator for 19 days. I got a trach, all that stuff happened to me. Mm -hmm. But at what point when people are still at home and they know they've tested positive and in a lot of cases, people can't get into a hospital. They, they if they're fortunate, they maybe they get the, the monoclonal, you know, or they maybe get sent home. But if they have that small device uh, that measures oxygen on the finger through, through attaching it on the finger for 45 seconds or whatever it is, what number, like when people are still out and trying to figure out where they are in this whole thing. What numbers are they really getting in trouble with at, at a point is red, big right. red flag? Good question. In a normal, healthy person, your oxygen saturation should be above 95%, plain and simple. And usually it's 98, 99%, unless you have lung disease, like um, you've been, you're a smoker. And then sometimes the oxygen saturation will hover more around 91, 90%. Um, and we don't want to get, um, it has to do with uh, changing the equilibrium of the body. So it's not that if they're that low, they couldn't get oxygen. It's just that we have to be very careful with giving them oxygen. Those who are healthy, um, without being sick with COVID. Uh, we like to send you home with the oximeter. And when it starts moving down towards 92%, 
that's when I encourage people to call the doctor on call so that we can see how you're doing and we can advise you. Once it gets below 90%, you need to go to the hospital. And you may still feel fine, but it's the damage that's going on inside the lungs that you can't see. Um, and I'll give you an example. So uh, when we talk about people who have emphysema or COPD from smoking, 90% of the lung has to be damaged before they become really sick from it. So 90% 90, 90 of that lung has to be gone. And by then, so you only have a small amount that's functioning. And by then you need oxygen to walk around and have your daily activities. So um, the body is amazing in how it can compensate for staying alive. But we don't want to wait till that point because again, what was your oxygen? Do you do you remember what it was when you went to the hospital, Joe? No, I don't. I know it was low 80s, I believe, is what your wife had told right. me. I think that and, sounds um, right. Yeah. And you were still walking around, maybe barely, I'm not sure, but you know, and then on the X-ray. <laughs> yeah, on the X-ray, it was real clear. It was um, a whiteout. So, yeah, the X-ray looked like um, COVID. The X-ray looked, you know, the healthy lungs. The the X-rays are darker, but mine are seventy percent were white, and it looks like I had um, the shards of white glass. Like if you took a pane of glass and just shut, threw it down on the ground and watched it shatter into a million pieces. That's what that thing looked like. It looked nasty, but that's what COVID does to the lungs. Yeah. One of the things it does to the lungs. So that's so important is that even though you might not feel so bad, when you have low oxygen levels, it's actually doing damage to your lungs. And so that ox, what is it, the oximeter? Pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter is so important to have and to use, to use it even if you feel okay. Yes. And we provide that from the clinic mm -hmm. when you have a positive. Okay. We have some questions. Um, Meadow is asking if UHS is offering testing to patients. So basically someone who needs to get tested, they call the clinic, right? Yes. So uh, there are certain criteria. Uh, if they need to be tested because they've been directly exposed to someone who had COVID they can make an appointment and then they'll tell them what time to come through the back part of the tent. Um, sometimes people wanna get tested after they've already tested positive, but we're not doing that. It can take up to a couple months before uh, you will test negative. So testing to see when you turn negative, that, that's not a good use of, um, that resource um, and it's very limited, the resource and it's super expensive. So um, we have to be careful. So we have it available for the folks who are sick. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you need it to go into the hospital, some people might have an elective procedure that they're gonna have, but they have to have a negative COVID test. So um, that that is, is another good reason that we can do it. So NCTP, which is the North Coast Testing Partnership, offers testing um, throughout the community. So if you go to nctp.com, you can see their schedule. Um, and those tests actually um, take 24 to 72 hours to get back the results, but um, aren't they don't have the strict requirements, but they don't have the as fast of turnaround time either as we do at UHS. So there are a couple of op options. Brenda, hello, Brenda, we're happy to see you. I know that um, you are very, very close friends with Joe and we welcome you. Um, Stephanie has a question and um, she's coming in the back door cause she texted me. So I wanna, <laughs> she's like, okay, Liz, ask Dr. Martinez this. So are you ready, Dr. Martinez? <laughs> I think she texted me too. <laughs> <laughs> she wants her question answered. <laughs> So what about, tell us about obesity and our risks as Indians with immunity historical 
immunity historically, and today a result of historical trauma such as smallpox. How hard, how, and how it's hard to not mix households with our family, especially our kids and grandkids. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the one about obesity is pretty straightforward. That is one of the risk factors for getting really sick with COVID and potentially dying. Um, and it is one of the um, criteria under the monoclonal antibody treatment. So, um, so yes, uh, we, I don't know that we really know why that is the case. Um, it just does increase our risk. And then for American Indian people, historically, uh, we were exterminated by numerous acts of genocide, including the smallpox infected blankets that were given to us. And, um, and so sometimes people feel a little bit more cautious about new treatments and new modalities because of what has happened to our people in the past. And um, I'm not saying the Western uh, medicine is 100%, but we do base the medicine on evidence. So we're not experimenting and we go with the best information we have. And that would apply to the vaccine and to treatments. Um, I hear that uh, Pfizer is in the middle of developing a antiviral against COVID. That's through Stat Pharma. Um, and um, so that's exciting news that there's something in the works because that can really get us ahead of this infection. Yeah. When so it comes, oh, one more thing though, one more answer here, and that is, um, you know, multi generational families living in one household, which is what many of us do. Yeah. And um, so it's hard. It's hard uh, to say, well, you need to isolate. And, you know, when I was thinking about your grandchildren, Jai, it was like, I could imagine that sometimes they were knocking on the door and saying, Grandpa, <laughs> or something oh, wow. along those lines, you know, because they want to go hang out with you. Um, but it's so important to, to be cautious and isolate if you're supposed to. Um, so I'm sure it would have broke my heart if it was my grandchildren <laughs> knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it increases our risk. And I think that may have contributed to the, the bad hit that the Navajo tribe had with um, COVID. But, you know, we all are at high risk for this as American Indians, not because of race, but because of all the other factors that have affected us, including social determinants of health and trauma. Right. And trauma and our, you know, our history with the government, that actually had an impact on your, on, on your decision, Jai, to not get vaccinated. Do you want to share your thoughts around that at that time before you got COVID? What was the question again? Your thoughts that you had um, shared earlier about why you did not get, want to get vaccinated. Yeah, so my biggest thought was like, you know, how the government tried to, you know, get rid of us before mm -hmm. and uh, our people, and it's kind of hard now to even trust the government, but so that was kind of my, my biggest uh, reason why I didn't want to do it, because I didn't know, you know, what's actually in there. I didn't know if they really tried to help us. Uh, uh, well, it wasn't until I got sick and I realized, you know, that's, that's a real thing. And uh, but then also, you know, the older I, I get, you know, I start to realize that, you know, there's also good people out there trying to do good for uh, that are in the government that actually care about every human being, you know, not just specific ones. Um, they don't just think about themselves. Uh, so that's, I guess, when I'm, the older I get, I'm starting to realize that more so so after i got sick i ended up you know going to go going and got the the uh shot the moderna shot 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got one, got that one. I really appreciate you, Jai, for sharing that because I know a lot of Native people have that belief and that fear and that distrust. And it really is, it's, it's real. That distress is real. Um, but I'm glad that you are here and encouraging people to get vaccinated now um, because there are people um, who really care. And I point to Dr. Martinez because she is a great doctor and she really does care about, about our community as, as does Joe and um, to be able to share your story. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, well, Facebook is lit up, you guys. I'm going to have to share some more um, comments. So Brenda, hey, Brenda, she says, thank you for sharing such personal stories. I believe in prayer, and I just found out a nephew has COVID and isn't feeling well. Um, please send prayers for him. So definitely, we will do that, Brenda. Um, welcome to Winona. She thanks you for your presentation. And Bill, brought back from the brink. You're a tough one, Joe. <laughs> Mirna, she, she says hello. Um, and let's see, Trish is saying thank you for sharing your stories. And then um, Dr. Martinez, you can remind us about mixing households, including our close families. That was a yes. comment. Okay, yeah. yes. Um, are there plans to um, resume asymptomatic testing at Padua? And I don't think there are right now. Is that correct, Dr. Martinez? Uh, you know, it's always evolving, so I can't say. But, you know, in the early days, we were testing antibodies to see if anybody had antibodies against it. We've stopped doing that now. Uh, we're not doing that at all. In terms of testing for covid folks who are asymptomatic, we are testing if they have a direct contact with somebody and you want to wait three to five days after you've had that contact with somebody who had COVID because it may not show up if you come too soon. Mm -hmm. Also, you could be asymptomatic and, you know, like even moms who are going to go in the hospital to have their babies, they need to get tested um, of course, the hospitals are now testing. So, so tell me a direct contact because not everybody realizes or understands what a direct contact is. So that's not my daughter's boyfriend's friend. No. What no. is a direct contact? It would be somebody that you spent time with in a closed environment. Um, let's say you're traveling in a car for four hours, that is definitely a contact, direct contact, or in the same room with somebody who had COVID, um, you know, that's a direct contact. So like kids in the classroom. Now I'll give you an example. Um, my kids um, got tested because they had a direct contact from somebody else who was sick with positive with COVID. Mm -hmm. So we want to say hello to Stacy and Anita, um, more of our viewers. Let's see, Teresa's asking, is there a waiting period to get the vaccine after testing positive for COVID? Oh, well, we want you to uh, get over your symptoms. That's the big one. And so definitely if you test positive, you want to wait the full 10 days. And then it depends on if, whether you're having symptoms uh, because some people do have long COVID, which can last up to six months, maybe longer. Um, but then the other part is, is that if you didn't get admitted to the hospital and you did not receive monoclonal antibodies, then you can get your vaccine fairly soon after. Okay. You receive the antibodies, then um, they encourage you to wait a good three months. Okay, so there's might be longer. Yeah. So really, um, contact your your provider. Yep. He'll know your medical history and um, how you were treated. Okay, that was a great question. Mm -hmm. Another question is, um, or a comment is that a friend got COVID and they said zero. They had zero appetite and barely ate anything for a week. 
So it really does impact your appetite and just how you feel. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Any other thoughts about um, the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated people who test positive for COVID? So what are, what's the difference? Because I've heard people say, well, I got vaccinated and now I learn I still could get COVID. So what was the benefit of getting vaccinated? Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> well, um, uh, they did a study um, end of July and they um, CDC did, and they were looking at, well, you know, these are the numbers. So they found that you had a 0.04% chance of being hospitalized with COVID if you had the vaccine. So that's what I tell people. Do you want the vaccine or do you want COVID? COVID vaccine. Vaccine, you might get COVID, but you're likely not gonna end up in the hospital. You also have a 0.01% chance of dying from COVID if you had the vaccine and got sick with COVID. So, so it's so, close to zero. So if you, not. yeah, so if you're vaccinated, um, it's it's unlikely. We won't say impossible, but unlikely that you would need to be hospitalized. Right. And even more unlikely that you would die. Right. right. You know, maybe down the road we'll come up with vaccinations that could like really keep us from getting COVID, but. Um, but the outcomes are still very good. And those, you know, when they report folks in the hospital, 98% of people who are sick with COVID have, are unvaccinated. Okay. We wanna say hi to Sharon and to Katrina. And um, what, Dr. Martinez, what should we do if um, we have a family member that we feel needs to be in the hospital or at least needs to be examined in the emergency room, but they won't see that family member, what should we do? Should we call our provider? What do we do in that situation? Well, you mean the ER won't see them? The ER won't see them. Mm -hmm. And and they said because they're not sick? Because they don't think they're sick enough or they don't, yeah. So um, yeah, I think calling the provider is a good idea. Uh, one is that uh, maybe they're eligible for monoclonal antibody, um, but um, maybe they need to try a different ER. I don't always encourage that, but um, some ERs are more better equipped for treating folks with COVID. Okay. Okay. Can you tell us more about um, the vaccine that's for 12 and under? Ah, it's coming out. Mm -hmm. Pfizer. It's the same Pfizer vaccine at lower doses. And they it took a, t a bit of time because they wanted to get the dose right and not give them too much and not too little. So, um, you know, I heard something was coming out in the spring and then we didn't hear a thing about it until now. And um, so they feel that it's ready now. Okay, but it hasn't been released yet? For well, uh, I believe it just recently was approved by the CDC, but I'd have to look it up, okay. sorry. But UHS um, doesn't have that yet? Not yet, not okay. yet, but um, we will be getting it. Okay, and it's likely that, that we'd have to make an appointment, right, with the parent to be able to, or a guardian to be able to, to do those. Absolutely. Things. Um, who knows, we may go back to um, vaccine clinics, you know, if the numbers are going up again, because we also know that the CDC is recommending a booster for any, everyone above, I believe, 64 years old. Um, that was the so, next question. So, <laughs> there what's you go. The third, so the third booster, and that's a Pfizer as well, right? Mm -hmm. The third vaccine. Mm -hmm. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Okay, well, 
I, I haven't done my reading, I apologize. Um, so um, it basically is going to um, just boost your immune system. I can't tell you the exact dose that you're getting. It could actually be the same vaccine, just the third course. Okay. And the people now for that could get that are 65 and older, right? That is for the booster. Now the booster is not the same as the third dose. That's where I, I haven't delineated the difference. Okay. So there's a third dose you can get if you're in the high risk category, such as you have HIV, you have no spleen, your spleen was taken out. Uh, you've got very poor kidney function and uh, a number of other criteria. So if you're eligible for the third dose, that's separate from what they're talking about with the booster. Okay. So the best thing, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was, the best thing would be to um, contact your provider because your provider will know your medical history and can make the best recommendation for you. Joe, what were you going to say? I wanted to ask Dr. Martinez, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think President Biden said that the booster would be available for everybody, blah, 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 pretty soon. But then about three days later, I think the CDC said that, no, that the Pfizer shot is going to be available for people, you know, uh, six, six months after their second vaccination shot for the Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Right. But I wanted to ask, but they have not approved the one for the Moderna. Do you think that they'll still be advising people to wait for six months from the time they got their second vaccination with Moderna before they tr attempt to get what's, what, what might be called a booster from Moderna? I, I really do believe that's coming. And Joe, because um, I, I just read on that stat um, website as well that uh, Janssen is working on, is gonna be working on a, a booster. So yeah, we're, we are looking at boosters. Um, so be ready. And usually what we put out a lot of our um, notices on Facebook and we also post it to the UHS website. So yeah. when you, you know, if you wanna know when we're going to be offering uh, the different vaccines that are available, look on our website mm -hmm. or look on Facebook. And we'll also be sending out releases to our tribal partners. So then they can also, um, encourage and educate their membership too with regards to the vaccines that are available. So one and, of the- uh, one, oh, go ahead. So yes, and, and you know, because the, the news is changing so fast, I would say, yeah, looking weekly would be great. It is changing really fast. So one question that we did get is how do we visit our family safely? Mm -hmm. So we're still masking. Right, still masking, visiting outdoors, um, remaining six feet apart. Any other suggestions? I mean, those were the main things that we talked about was masking, I mean, you know, a year ago, masking, um, good hand hygiene and social distancing. And those, still, these, those things are still true now, right? Definitely. So that would be a good way to continue with visiting. I know that um, I didn't see my dad for almost a year. And because um, he wouldn't come see us until we got vaccinated. And so I had to wait until it was my turn, but we would visit on Zoom. So that was a really good way for us because we could see um, each other. And we actually had a birthday party for my nephew on mm. Zoom and everybody mm -hmm. dressed up uh, to with the theme of the party. So Zoom has been really helpful for our family. And plus it brought in people from other areas. Um, that normally wouldn't have been able to participate. So Zoom has been a really good thing for our family. Jai and Joe, what do you do to visit with family to be safe? Oh, shoot. I'm, I'm the worst example because I, <laughs> I, I, I will wear a mask, but I don't want to tell my family, but you know, it's, it's a real mixed bag among our loved ones, right? And uh, I think we're very innocent and naive, you know? I, I, uh, I don't want to be throwing stones at my own loved ones. I know you're not asking me to do that. I know that I know that when I go outside, I don't blink an eyelash 
never have about wearing a mask, no matter where I go. And I, and I find myself growling under my breath and I see so many people in stores all over the place not wearing them anymore. And I'm just thinking like, I, I, I'm thinking people are caught up in wishful thinking that somehow this is just all behind us, you know? And um, I don't know, I don't get I don't get preachy, but I tell you what, this this anecdote, I'll keep it short. My, I sat with my son and one of his buddies for an hour before about, oh shoot, about five or six days before I was in the hospital with COVID fighting for my life and I didn't know I was sick with COVID. And we talked for like an hour and I made sure I was six feet away from them and I had a mask on the whole time and neither one of them got COVID and I almost died from it. So does that story, is that there's something in that story right there. Yeah. So I was the only one in that, in that uh, room there was a bunch of people. I was the only person wearing a mask. I'm glad nobody got COVID for me anyway. I mean, you know, who knows, right? But I never heard about it. But I, you worry about your immediate family, right? Your kids and your spouse and your grandchildren. And so wearing that mask, how simple, right? But how protective. And, and, and I, I want to be more diligent about wearing an N95 because they're the best. They, they look a little bit funny or whatever, but so what? If they protect us and if they protect other people from getting this this virus. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jai? They're expensive to get, but they're really super, super protective. Yes, they are. They are. Did you have any thoughts about that, Jai, and keeping your family safe and protected? Um, I think just um well. We're kind of fortunate enough to where we have a big enough house where well, my immediate family we all live together you know and uh we you know since the whole COVID thing started in you know 2020 we didn't see a lot of our family you know for like almost a year uh well over a year and even now it's like it's starting to trickle like you know things are starting to open back up like sports events and you know uh, I think we just had a birthday party for my uncle the other day. It was indoors, but we wore masks, you know, we followed the protocol and stuff. And, uh, you know, we weren't able to go to, you know, uh, ceremonies or powwows, uh, you know, just for that reason also. So that's where you like, meet a lot of your family uh, there yeah. too. And um, so, um, I mean, just... When we go outdoors, we're kind of more lenient, you know. We'll see my aunties and uncles and stuff. Uh, but when we're indoors, we definitely wear a mask, you know. Yeah, we're the same too. I wanted to I wanted to say that uh, I've only really visited a very few homes of relatives. I call them to tell them I'm thinking about them. I love them. I want to drop by with some flowers sometime, you know. <laughs> some of my aunties, but um, my 102 102 year old great aunt is, you know, she has been able to have visitors for what, a year and a half now in her care home in Crescent City. But I used to go see her at least once a month for an hour. And, uh, but I got to talk to her a couple of weeks ago. That was wonderful. It was just, oh, how are you, honey? I, I've been worrying about you. Well, I've been worried about you too. <laughs> but yeah, but so I, the one family, I've, one relative from my tribe I've stayed with during all of this, she also had both shots. So we we both felt okay about not wearing a mask, and we both yeah. recently got our shots. I was in a in a group setting, and um, my husband asked everybody around us if they were vaccinated, and they were. So that was cool. So then we took our masks off because everyone was vaccinated. But I thought that was pretty cool that he asked everyone, "Are you <laughs> vaccinated?" And everybody they were okay with it. They were like, "Yeah, we're vaccinated," and yeah, it was pretty cool. Celine. Um, is here and she left a message for you, Jai. Jai is family to us. Grateful to hear you and Joe for sharing. The power of prayers are mighty, giving great thanks to the creator. So that's for you, Jai. Um, Trish says, if you are sick with cold or flu-like symptoms, are you still requiring those clients to get COVID tested before they are seen at the clinic? Yes. Okay, so we're still screening at the door. So just to remind everyone, um, all of the doors have um, a screening device to check for your 
your temperature, and then there's a questions. And if you ask answer yes to any of those symptoms, we do ask for you to be screened um, by a provider and possibly tested um, at all of our clinics. Okay, I think I'm finally caught up on the on the comments. Um, we are going to we're hitting on an hour. It just went by like that. Do let's um, we can start doing our closing comments. If any of you watchers have a final comment or question, please put that in our comment section now. And we're going to start off with our closing comments. Who would like to start us off? Joe, would you like to start us off? Oh, wow. Uh, um, you know, I think that regarding the testing, you know, until somebody's extremely sick, sick to death, in this case with this, the COVID-19, I think it really, really sinks in yeah. how powerful, how potentially beautiful and meaningful each human life is and that it has to be protected and treasured and yes death is part of our lifespan you know and we, we go on to be with our ancestors but being that ill really drives it home what a blessing it is to be with your your spouse your children your grandchildren every single time you encounter them it's like uh i knew that before but it's like i can see it even 10 times more magnified now because the, the, you know, and like, like Jai said, um, th this is sort of branching out for a second, but I also thought that I didn't understand why they wouldn't feed me when I was in, in a rehab, rehabilitation hospital in Reading. I thought it was a government experiment on native, on native people again, <laughs> that they're starving me. I didn't know that I had a, a, a pick in my stomach they were feeding me through a tube because of I had a you know uh, intubated and um, had a tracheoscopy and you know and a pipe in my throat to help me live and it took they tried to work with me for like a week or longer to encourage me no it's no we're gonna we want you to get food we have to get better first you have to be able you have to be able to breathe on your own and but you know you think these horrible things and I don't think people want to go there I think vaccination is so easy it's like you know, uh, you don't have to be the anti-Joe <laughs> to, to realize like, you know, the, the dreams are so crazy and kind of horrific sometimes if you if you get a bad case of it, that why would anybody want to go there if, if you could just, um, just another vaccination really. But I know a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people think that there's weird stuff with it, but um, I jumped on it the second it was available and I, I think everybody else did too. I just feel like, just from a few doc film documentaries I've seen on, on how this disease works and about how the vaccine counteracts it, I'm thinking like, I didn't need to see five hours of that. I, I felt convinced after seeing a couple of them that this, this stuff will work to fight it, to save lives. Yeah, for sure. I, I believe that too, it saves lives. Jai, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, you know, at first I was kind of hesitant about, you know, the whole COVID and, you know, the vaccination. And then after I got sick, you know, I'm like a believer now. And, uh, you know, I don't want anyone, anybody to get sick. And I think, you know, what you guys are doing is a, you know, a good thing, you know, uh, by trying to spread the message out to the community, you know, and uh, it's hard to, it's hard to believe, you know, what's out there, you know, you hear all these different stories, you know, people's point of view and stuff, but uh, in the Native community, you know, not too much of my family, you know, would have really talked about it, but I know that seeing like a lot of the, like the dance leaders and the, the elders, you know, tell you to get vaccinated, you know, for your people and stuff. That's uh and that's really heavy stuff. And I respect that, you know, and I think the more that you get, you know, different community members to speak up like that to the younger generation and the kids and even the, the young bucks, you know, the teenagers and you know the ones that uh you know kind of have my 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 uh mindset a little bit, 
uh, you know, it, it kind of opens up your your mindset to, you know, for that, you know, that, uh, you know, I guess to, you know, get vaccinated, I guess is what I'm trying to say, you know, yeah. but I think everyone wants to protect their family, you know, that's in the long run. That's what we're here for. And uh, us being, you know, that's what native people about uh, family and love, you know, and that's what it's all about. So, so thank you guys for, you know, allowing me to, you know, do this and just my, my point of view, my story, I guess, and you, Joe, you know, thank you too. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Your, your story is very moving, also. I think, and thank you for sharing. And I think it's really good, good medicine for us to share that, you know, uh, our fears, our, our reluctance, our our trials, our suffering. You know, uh, it's not any worse than what other people go through, but but we're part of them, and we want them to know we care, and we hope that they'll really consider and and re-examine if they're still kind of sitting in the middle you know, on, on the vaccination, but right. it is an individual choice. So there's a lot of love for you two gentlemen on here on Facebook. So I just wanted <laughs> to let you know that all kinds of hearts on here on the comments. Um, you are so important. Both of you are so important to our community and to our world. I want you both to know that both of you have a very special place in my heart. I know you know that. Rob England has a question. Has sharing your story, Jai or Joe, has your story convinced other people to now get vaccinated? I don't know. You know? I think I think a couple of people. Uh, one of my one of my hostler relatives from Smith River saw the billboard that UIHS put up in Del Norte County by the Lucky Seven Casino. <laughs> And he said, you know, I was, I was going to, to get my second shot and I saw you on that billboard with your granddaughters. And he says, I even had all the more motivation to get the shot that day, the second shot. So that made me feel really proud. Yeah, that's a good billboard. Don't wait, vaccinate. That's the theme. Yeah. So that's I know a few people have. And, and also I've, I've talked to some Native friends who've, who uh, my wife and I have been talking to some Native friends uh, some of my former students who have close relatives uh, who've been in the hospital, um, we one passed from the Round Valley Reservation tribes, and she had like a hundred living descendants when she died at the time of her death a couple of months ago. And she's a sweetheart. She took one of my classes at Humble Stage. She audited. I was so thrilled to have an elder from that reservation in my class about ten years ago, and. Uh, but you know, they did everything they could at the hospital, I think in Ukiah for her. But um, but another person my wife and I have been talking to for weeks, their their child just got out from a local tribe. Their child just got out, out of the hospital yesterday and it was very touch and go for a while with the COVID. And so we're really thrilled for that family, you know. So I, I didn't expect that the we would end up talking to people who heard heard the rough ride that we had. Oh yeah, that's a rough ride for sure. So that's I was really glad when people reached out to us, you know, just through messenger or email or whatever, you know. Dr. Martinez, do you have any closing comments? Oh, sure. I, uh, I really appreciate hearing your stories. Jai and Joe, you know, you know, stepping up and 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 encouraging others to, you know, stay safe, watch their symptoms, and get protected. Because um, it's all about family. Uh, it's about family and keeping our loved ones safe and healthy. Um, and uh, I I got a text from a friend who recently lost a loved one. And, and that, that's, you know, it takes its toll on all of us. I almost lost my sister and brother-in-law from COVID, um, but thank goodness um, they came out of it. They're well, 
And um, I'm real grateful for that. And I'm real grateful that you're still alive, Joy, because you got at least another 60 years to go. And Joe, you've got another at least 30 years to go. So I'm glad you guys are around. Me too. Well, I want to thank you all, Dr. Martinez, Joe and Jai for joining me this evening. I also want to recognize Sawaram David Baldy for the beautiful backgrounds um, that we have and for producing today's Facebook Live. Um, and I want to thank each and every one of our watchers for all of your love that you shared in the comments. When we get off of here, I know Jai and Joe are going to go back in and they're going to see how much um, how important they are to us and how much we all love them. So thank you all for tuning in and spending your evening with us. We'll be doing our drawing tomorrow. Please remember to be safe, mask, social distance, and practice good hygiene. Until next time, we'll see you later. Chew. Master.